None of us join the school board because we are hoping to supervise the decline of a once great school district. We ran for this board because we saw a wave of Trumpism taking over decision making in school districts all over this country. And people like me were like, dear God, I'm going to run, run for school board before something like that in my community happens. And I will take exception with one important talking point that's been repeated a few times and I think is really problematic. And it's this idea that we as a board have driven students out of this school district with our woke politics. No way. I still have nightmares about it. Nightmares about yeah. it. You really, five years later, you still think about it? Yeah, even more so now than before. Some people will chalk this up to a culture war documentary. There's political stuff outside her door and like in the hall beside her door. And it's like, I don't want that in the classroom. Or even dismiss it as right-wing propaganda. How often would you say that LGBTQ issues were talked about in class? Every class. But to do that, you'd have to ignore the stories of these kids who are sitting down for the first time to share their experiences as students in a school district where academics are too often overshadowed by the political agenda of adults. Neither side of politics belong in school, nor does religion, nor does anything that is personal beliefs. A teacher should not be forcing personal agenda onto students, no matter what it is. And it is so important that we try and stop this because it's out of hand. What are the impacts of trans and queer exclu exclusion in the classroom? I don't want this to be negotiable. Like, we're going to negotiate whether or not we're going to provide a transgender student their rights. That's not negotiable. That's how we create the discomfort where we grow. Something might seem neutral on its face, but it actually has a disparate impact based on poverty or race or any of those different types of demographics. No one has covered the issues in the Olympia, Washington School District as much as Alicia Perkins. My husband and I are both alumni of the Olympia School District, as are my three children. She runs a Substack and a Facebook page called OSD Rescue, where she's detailed dozens of stories of failures within the district, many of them brought to her by other parents. These parents who are coming forward are really courageous, and um, this needs to be exposed to improve things that have gone wrong in some of our public schools. Alicia helped to expose the violent anti-cop rhetoric of a now former school board member, Talana Reed. And it amazes me how those pigs can sit over there to watch us peacefully discuss, talk about what we want changed in this, in this state. It amazes me. And they don't pay attention until we tear shit up. So just see, before I get started, tear everything up in this fucking city until they do what we want them to do. Reed lost her race for re-election last year, but the Olympia School Board is still packed with ideologues, like one of its newest members, Jess Turtelot Palumbo, an activist whose social media posts are, well... I'm, I'm gonna be completely honest, as a white person, like, my first thought was like, oh, that's an interesting idea, and then, like, I took a couple more seconds, um, and I was like, that's not an interesting idea at all. That's an idea that I feel like is creating space for white folks to feel safe or to feel good about doing something um, about the racism within law enforcement. And it doesn't take away from the fact that law enforcement and SROs come from the seed of racism. And you can rename them something and you can try to create different branches but if that seed is still there, it's going to create the same problem. And that same problem is going to tell our students um, who are marginalized, uh, who have disabilities, who come from the BIPOC community, that their safety is less important 
that they don't matter. And they do matter. And it's not just that they matter. It's that they're phenomenal. They have incredible races and are amazing leaders. But we don't say that enough, right? Like, we don't tell that enough. And by voting SROs into schools, we are going to silence them. And we are going to cause fear. Palumbo is in good company on the Olympia School Board, where meetings are driven by political debate. In one meeting about budget cuts, members explained why they were getting rid of fourth grade music classes. Apparently, even wind instruments are racist. There are problems with how elementary instrumental music is administered right now. Um, we know that there are disproportionalities in how it's rolled out at each campus. We know that people experience different amounts of time of elementary instrumental music education. We know that there are some places where students never miss core instruction as a result of going to instrumental music. And we know that there are other campuses where that's a struggle. Um, we also know that, that there are other folks in the community that experience things like a tradition of ex excellence as exclusionary. And I don't think that there's just one or two or 10 or 20 people that think that. Um, but that's not unique to elementary instrumental music. Uh, we're, we're a school district that lives in, in is an entrenched and is surrounded by white supremacy culture. And that's a real thing. And there's nothing about string or wind instrumental music that is intrinsically white supremacist. Um, however, the ways in which it is and the ways in which all of our institutions, not just schools, but local government, state government, our churches, our neighborhoods, uh, inculcate and allow white supremacy culture to continue to be propagated and cause significant institutional violence um, are things that we have to think about carefully as a community. In an official school board declaration this year honoring Black Lives Matter Week, OSD called on teachers at all levels to ground their work in the 13 guiding principles of the Black Lives Matter at School movement. Those guiding principles include disrupting the Western prescribed nuclear family, freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, dismantling cisgender privilege, and uplifting black trans folk. Hallways and classrooms across the Olympia School District are a reflection of those ideologies. A clear indication that politics isn't just welcome in the classroom, it's part of the fabric of the district. And that activism is rubbing off on students who have staged walkouts for everything from abortion to gun control to Black Lives Matter, and more recently a walkout against Israel's war in Gaza. Not surprising considering the indoctrination of students starts young at OSD. And it's not just rogue teachers working their politics into lesson plans. It's part of organized and authorized activities, like a fifth grade club that explicitly prohibits white students. The school's principal said it was necessary to provide a safe space for students of color. Again, that's fifth grade. In a report last year, Undivided detailed a disturbing sex ed lesson in a fourth grade classroom taught by a guest from Planned Parenthood. Parents were understandably shocked at the content, which wasn't approved by the district or given to them ahead of time. A handout depicted drawings of the different ways vaginas and penises might look, and even intersex organs. And for some reason, a drawing of a vagina with the face of a cat. Another page from the handout showed images of items students might need once they hit puberty, like tampons, razors, and deodorant. Except the page also showed a picture of a puberty blocker, even listing the brand name of the implant, Superlin LA. The material also included something called the gender wheel. It was created by Maya Gonzalez, a Chicanx gender queer femme with three decades of experience as an independent researcher with a specific focus on LGBTQ and suppressed history. The gender wheel allows kids to choose variations of pronouns, body types, and genders to see if any combination lines up with how they feel. For example, the gender wheel could depict an intersex trans femme who uses the pronoun Zay or an intersex girl who is non-binary and uses the pronoun tree. Yes, tree. 
So in other words, the lesson taught fourth grade kids make believe, not legitimate sex education. But in all the reporting we've done on the Olympia School District, two cases stand out. In the summer of 2023, we broke a story about a Centennial Elementary School teacher named Jennifer Knight, who helped one of her fifth grade students, a 10 year old, hide her gender identity from her parents. Now, to be clear, that's not just an Olympia School District policy. That's a policy across Washington's public school system, and one being enforced by two-term superintendent of public instruction, Chris Rakedahl. He says a student's gender identity is protected health information that teachers and staff will not share with parents, despite a voter initiative that became law this year demanding transparency for families. Reichdahl put out a directive saying in cases where a student identifies as transgender, the law will be ignored in the interest of protecting trans kids whose parents might not be supportive. But shielded by that policy, Jennifer Knight took things much further, exposing how such directives that encourage secrecy can lead to unhealthy and inappropriate teacher-student relationships. Emails obtained through public disclosure show disturbing communications between Knight and that 10-year-old student, a biological girl who wanted to start using he-them pronouns. We'll call that student Taylor. In an email to staff, Knight wrote, Taylor has opened up to me these past few months and has just requested this change. Please understand that this change is his right and is not to be questioned. Please also know that they are not going by this change at home and we will not be discussing this with his family. But Knight took the secrecy even further, writing private emails to Taylor. You need to get a personal email set up so we still have a way to communicate. I would take you into my home anytime you need. I kept emailing you, but I was worried your mom interfered before you saw my messages. Make sure this email is deleted when we are done because otherwise when your mom looks, you will be outed instantly. When Taylor's parents did find out, they were so disturbed by Jennifer Knight's conduct that they moved their daughter out of the district and eventually out of the country. The family returned to India where they immigrated from. If a child is struggling with this and maybe questioning their gender and things like that, I think parents, for the most part, 99.9% .9 of them care and love and support their kid and want to be involved in those uh, conversations with their kids. David Olson is a candidate for state school superintendent who has advocated strongly to change policies that keep parents in the dark. I'm a firm believer that schools are, are there to educate our kids, not parent the kids. Um, I think that counselors can, you know, say, yeah, we understand these are some difficult issues. Have you talked to your parents? And be able to say you might want to talk to your parent. And I think I would prefer to see schools encourage conversation with parents versus what Chris Reichdahl seems to want, and that's discourage parental conversations with the kid. The Olympia School District has declined to tell us whether Knight was in any way reprimanded for her behavior, which is a common theme. We got the same answer from the district when we asked about the conduct of a middle school science teacher named Karina Champion. Does anybody know who Trayvon Martin is? The person who killed him did not go to jail was not charged because of a racist law that's currently in Florida that allows people to kill someone else if they are scared. And how this law is generally applied is by white supremacists who say they were scared just by the presence of a black or brown person. That's part of a cell phone recording of Karina Champion taken by this now seventh grader, Peyton. Peyton and her twin brother, Reese, were mostly homeschooled, but their parents enrolled them in a few classes at the Olympia Regional Learning Academy as they got older. It's part of the Olympia School District. The sixth grade class you were in, uh, science class at, at Orla, explain to people what Orla is. Go ahead, uh, Reese. Okay, so Orla is like the uh, Olympia Regional Learning Academy. It's kind of where students can come in for in-person classes who are homeschooled and it's a hybrid and you can kind of choose what classes you're gonna take with which teachers and like when. It was during their sixth grade science class at Orla that Karina Champion, a seventh and eighth grade teacher, came in for a guest presentation. She was supposed to talk to them about a quilt depicting different types of plants and insects that they'd be helping out with the following school year. 
So you guys are doing your science class thing and you find out you're going to have a guest teacher. It's going to be a seventh and eighth grade uh, science teacher named Karina Champion. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction when you learned that Miss Champion was going to come into the class? I was just hoping uh, that she wouldn't bring any sort of politics into it uh, beforehand. Why would that be your reaction? Uh, she's just kind of known for it and there's political stuff outside her door and like in the hall beside her door and it's like I don't want that in the classroom. Did you worry about that too Peyton? It was a little bit concerning to me but I was thinking you know let's see the best in people let's see I mean it's about bugs it's about a bug quilt I mean how can she turn this possibly into whatever like how can she turn this into something negative or positive mm -hmm. but I wasn't prepared or expecting what happened. Instead of talking about bugs, Karina Champion displayed this presentation, Quilts for Awareness and Activism. When she started ranting about Ronald Reagan, Peyton knew she needed to do something. What was going through my mm -hmm. mind? I was like, I was like in my head, I was like, okay, this is getting uncomfortable for me. I don't know what to do. And then immediately I thought, phone, where's my phone? I need to record this to, to like just have proof or something mm -hmm. or just evidence of what happened and what was weird to me. Mm -hmm. And I can show my parents and maybe feel a little bit more comfortable and they can explain what was what she was saying or what was happening. Because this disease was primarily affecting gay people and he was homophobic, he chose to stop any funding to go towards trying to solve this disease. And people were dying in huge, huge numbers because of his homophobia. Now we have medicines that we can take that prevent you from even getting HIV. We have medicines that help you care for your body if you do get HIV to the point where now the virus isn't even able to be found in your blood because it's at such a low level that you can't even infect other people with it. So because people organized around this issue and now this quilt has 50,000 panels of people who were killed by this virus and it gets taken and displayed all over the world now, not only has our government changed its policies and made it so that scientists could get money to study this disease and stop it from spreading, but it's happened in other countries all around the world. So this is a more recent one. Does anybody know who Trayvon Martin is? No? Okay. So Trayvon Martin was a kid who was a little bit older than you. He was 13 years old. He went to go walk to the corner store and got some Skittles and an iced tea for his brother. And on his way home, a white supremacist was following him in his truck and yelling at him and then got out and killed him. And the person who killed him did not go to jail, was not charged because of a racist law that's currently in Florida that allows people to kill someone else if they are scared. And how this law is generally applied is by white supremacists who say they were scared just by the presence of a black or brown person. So this quilt was made in protest of that event. And the reason it says rest in power Trayvon Martin is that because of the lack of judicial support in this event people organized to create what is now the black lives matter movement to try and get laws changed so that people who are black and brown have the same protections as people who are white which is what our country is supposed to stand for is justice for all why why is this in a science class i mean this seems very off topic 
As soon as she heard the recording, their mom, Jake, went to the school to demand answers. It took weeks for the school to hand over the presentation Champion gave. In fact, their mom had to file a public records request just to get it. It's not the first time Karina Champion has been under scrutiny. In 2019, the Olympian did a story on a sex ed lesson taught in a seventh grade class at Orla. While they didn't name the teacher, it was Karina Champion. Not only did parents say they weren't given notice of the sex ed lesson, Lesson, but that champion brought a sparkly dildo to class and talked about things like anal sex. In that case, the district did hire an outside investigator, but much of the claims made by students, Champion denied, like using the word dildo. She said it was an anatomically correct teaching device and it was a student who used that word to describe it. So we thought you might like to hear from two students who were actually there. One of the points that she was investigated for that she denied is using the phrase dildo. She says that was a student. Who was the first one in that class to use the word dildo? I believe that it was her first, mm -hmm. and then following that, it was another student who said it. Is that your recollection yeah. as well? Yeah, because then it caused a whole little frenzy in the class talking about that word from her. Meet Jameson and Rory. Both were in Champion's seventh grade class five years ago. They recently graduated from OSD. Somebody take me through how that happened. How did it come out? How did... So she got it from her locked cabinet and it was stuck it on the desk and she called it a dildo and then another student said that and we're all like, what? Like, none of us knew what it was, obviously. It was so uncomfortable and it just didn't sit right with anybody, not because it's sex ed, but just the whole way of going about it. She said that this was a teaching instrument that was given to her for the purpose of teaching sex ed. What did it look like? It looked like a dildo, pink, sparkly, <laughs> yeah. had a suction cup on the bottom. So that's when you say when she, she stuck it yeah, to the desk, like she a whole, actually stuck yeah. it to the desk. Mm -hmm. And what did, in what way did she use it during the lesson? It was just there. Yeah. yeah. Did she like use it to put condoms on or anything? Or One, is it? yeah. Okay, she did. There's also this issue of some things that were written on the board during this lesson. Can you recall any of them? Um, permanent sterilization. Uh, was it same sex something? Same sex. Yeah. Yeah. There was abstinence on there. Abstinence was on there. Yes. Okay. We didn't talk about it though. Oh, interesting. So the permanent sterilization thing is, I think, the thing that stuck out to me the most. Um, so you're saying abstinence and permanent sterilization were on the board, mm -hmm. and abstinence wasn't discussed, but did she talk to you about permanent sterilization? Yes. That was the one she talked about the most. I, I imagine at the time you didn't really understand how weird that is. No. And I think the worst part was is that there was nothing before to warn us about it. Yeah. She just dug in her closet at the start of class, brought this thing out and, you know, started talking. It w I would have expected, you know, at least a week before talking about it, warming us up to the whole idea. Telling your parents? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And both say Champion's inappropriate conduct went well beyond that one lesson. She, you know, spoke pretty openly about her private life, right? Who she was in a relationship with, her personal periods. Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Her what? Her periods, yeah. What? How her flow was for the Dur week. During sex ed or regularly? Any class that we had when she would go off topic on things. If she was on her period, she'd tell you how her flow was. Uh-huh. Jameson? Yes. Do you recall her talking about her period? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, and it was always like just in random classes too. Uh, math, she would talk about stuff like that. She would trail off on health related things versus what she was supposed to be teaching us. And you also said that you rarely had any academic assignments. Yeah, I would say we had about four major assignments all year long. And if you didn't turn them in, you'd still get an A. So how much of class would you say was comprised of actual learning of the topic? Because it was it math and science or math and science? Mainly science. Mainly science. How yeah. much, Jameson, of the class would be lessons on science? Um, probably around like 20, 30 percent. Everything else is just kind of like whatever she chose to talk about that day. Um, I, I skipped over one thing that was a 
about sex ed I want to revisit. It's just like the most awkward thing, so I'm kind of leaving it towards the end. So Rory, mm -hmm. she made a comment um, telling boys what they should do if they wake up with a boner, correct? Yeah. So characterize what she said for me. Um, that you should just rub it out, go into the other room. It was very uncomfortable, very inappropriate. Do you remember like when she said it, just how you felt? Oh, I put my head down on the table because I'm like, I'm not going to make eye contact with anybody. Because it was awkward because we were all mixed matched around the room. So you could have like two, three boys at your table and it was so uncomfortable. Like, it was not a good experience at all. Jameson, did she say that? Yes. You remember it unequivocally? Yeah. Yeah. How'd you feel when she said it? Very uncomfortable. <laughs> wishing that I wasn't there at the time. But for both of them, it was Champion's obsession with LGBTQ issues that stands out the most. Both say they were bullied for not being LGBTQ, not just by fellow students, but by Champion herself. So she was very big on LGBTQ issues. So it sounds like she was married previously to a man um, and, and now she has a partner with a woman. Totally fine, no big deal. Um, but how often would you say that LGBTQ issues were talked about in class? Every class. Every class. Yes. Like, There's at least once a week, multiple times a week. Mm -hmm. At the time, you know, she's obviously very supportive of LGBTQ youth. Um, from what you guys have said, it seemed like if you were in the class and you were LGBTQ or you changed to identify um, as LGBTQ that you felt as if they got special treatment. Oh yeah, they let's, were treated like royalty in the class. Can you let's talk about that a little bit more. So how did you, because are you guys both straight? Were you straight yes. in the seventh grade class, yeah. all of that? Um, so from your perspective, can you just tell me how that would manifest? Like how did you, why did you feel like they were getting special treatment? Um, well, it would be like her little group that's at closest to her. She would always talk with them. They would always get called on in class. You know, they could have their phones out if they wanted, play games, whatever. Basically do whatever they wanted. She claimed that I was an unhealthy, or I was unhealthy for the environment. I was creating an unsafe environment um, because there were viewpoints that I would like point out. I was like, hey, you're using that to get attention from the teacher. And she didn't like that, said that I was transphobic. Um, who called you transphobic? Uh, champion. Your teacher called you a seventh grader transphobic? Yeah. Yeah. And she said that I was like having toxic masculinity, stuff like that. Did she call you transphobic and accuse you of toxic masculinity in front of other students? Yeah. It was, so there was a particular student who ended up becoming trans and they would change their gender back and forth like weekly. And I misgendered them once, and that's kind of when it started, was then. Wow. So by accident, because yes. it had gone back and forth so much. Yes. She called you transphobic. How were you treated um, after the teacher in the class labels you a transphobe? Did that cause other people to, to treat you differently? That whole group, like, outed me, didn't want to talk to me, didn't want anything to do with me. So, yeah. Bullying. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Could you see that happening as well, Rory? Definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. We weren't allowed to sit where they sat because we were homophobic and everything like that because we were straight. I personally identify as a Christian and because of that, I was automatically homophobic, even though I knew known most of these people since kindergarten, first grade. Was the bullying ever happening in front of Miss Champion? Oh yeah, and she encouraged it. What do you mean encouraged it? Oh, she, she would put in her own little two cents into it and. She really wouldn't stop it or anything. So if the bullying was happening from the LGBTQ students, it was just fine. Yeah. Yeah. But if it happened the other way around, they're homophobic and they were outcasts in the classroom. So, you know, you've talked about kind of like looking back and feeling like you were bullied and, and excluded because you weren't gay or weren't trans. How has that experience stuck with you through, through the years since? Um, so I have a lot of issues as far as um, if a group of people has a disagreement with me, I kind of freak out about it and have like a whole bunch of anxiety because of it. Because um, it reminds me of back then mm -hmm. from when everybody seemed like they were against me. Um, 
So yeah, it's very anxiety inducing. Did the number of students who identified as LGBTQ, did it grow during that school year? Yes. From like, cause that, this is the class you've been with, right? There might've been one student at the start of the year and by the end it was like six, seven, eight maybe. Wow. And it was a very small class. I think we had less than 20 students or so. Less than 20, maybe 20. Both Rory and Jameson say they feel compelled to speak up all these years later, in part because they heard about the recording taken by Peyton and were disturbed to know that the school district is still ignoring Champion's behavior. After all these years, I mean, this is five years ago, you're done with the Olympia School District. Why are you willing to be here to talk to me about it today? So because of the things that happened with me, um, knowing that it could be happening to other students, and it is happening to other students currently, it keeps me up at night sometimes, you know, thinking about it. And so I just don't want to see it happen to other students. It's just important for everyone to know that this is crazy that this has happened. And no matter what side of politics it is, if it's, if it's, um, ranting about Ronald Reagan being homophobe or ranting about Trayvon Martin and Black Lives Matter or if it's ranting about MAGA and Trump, Trump w should win the election. It, neither side of politics belong in school, nor does religion, nor does anything that is personal beliefs. A teacher should not be forcing personal agenda onto students, no matter what it is. And it is so important that we try and stop this because it's out of hand. Unless the school districts start to realize that the decline in enrollment is uh, partially because parents are unsatisfied with, you know, what they are feeling is becoming an indoctrination of their kids with social agendas and political agendas. Um, unless there's some self-awareness that happens from the top, I, I don't really see an end to this. Um, I think that maybe as schools start to close, uh, that may have an impact, but I, I honestly don't, don't see an end anytime soon. None of us join the school board because we are hoping to supervise the decline of a once great school district, right? We ran for these offices because we were interested in making sure that there were real advancements in equity and inclusion. We, were, we ran for this board because we saw, well, at least I'll speak to myself personally, a wave of Trumpism taking over decision-making in school districts all over this country. And people like me were like, dear God, I'm gonna run, run for school board before something like that in my community happens. And, and I will take exception with one important talking point that's been repeated a few times and I think is really problematic. And it's this idea that we as a board have driven students out of this school district with our woke politics, okay? No way, all right? This school board, this school district, as long as I'm in this community, the pride proclamations are gonna keep happening. The Black Lives Matter proclamations are gonna keep happening. We will continue to invest in these schools until they're safe and equitable places for all students, irrespective of their color, their skin, their gender identity and gender expression. And if anyone has a problem with that, because you don't wanna be in a school district where those are the values, bye.